It's round seven of Norway chess, and we have the fascinating pairing of Magnus Carlsen with the white pieces playing against Ali Reza Firusha. Normally, when you have two of the world's strongest players uh, competing against each other, you either have a boring game because the level is too close, uh, not much is going to happen. But when you match these two players with each other, you definitely get to see fireworks. So may I call your attention for the, let's say, next 20 minutes or so, because this game has it all. You will absolutely enjoy yourself and make sure that you watch till the end, because something very special is going to happen at the very end of the game. Before we go there, just make sure to subscribe to the channel if you would like to see more of these uh, fascinating battles between Magnus Carlsen, Ali Reza, Firusha and many of the other world top players. Now let's dive straight into the action as Magnus opens up the game with the move 1 e4. And then we get to see the Sicilian defense after c5, knight f3. Firusha goes e6 and now already a big surprise. This is a very well-known position and most people who would like to get a sharp game will play the open Sicilian. Playing here the move d4, there are many other interesting possibilities as well but the move chosen by Magnus Carlsen is the 15th choice of the uh, online database. There have been so many different moves being tried here as well. The move played by Magnus Bishop d3, you may look what is this? You've never seen such a move and I can definitely recommend you not to try this at home because it's sort of an anti-positional developing move. You place the bishop in front of your d-pawn so that means the other bishop will have a harder time to get developed but there is a clear idea with this uh, specific uh, move as after knight c6 white is going to castle and let's say if black plays a normal developing move for instance knight f6 the idea is that you can play rook e1 the rook protects the pawn on e4 as well and next there is this plan of dropping back with the bishop to f1 which is a much better square and later on white will try to fight for the control in the center by playing c3 and move the d-pawn as well but here it's black's turn and instead of the move knight f6 Firusha had totally different ideas as look what he played here he went for the move g5 and that's a very sharp move looking for a big fight with the main point being that if white continues with its plan of rook e1 there is the move g4 and all of a sudden this knight on f3 is just trapped, cannot go anywhere, cannot go to h4 because the queen is covering that square. Therefore, Magnus changes his mind and decides to place the bishop on b5 anyway. Now, this is a square where the bishop can normally be developed to at, at once. But basically, Magnus is saying, okay, I wasted the tempo. You have weakened your kingside formation by playing very aggressively, moving the, the g-pawn. Firusha plays here the move bishop g7, very uh, interesting move. And now Magnus decides to trade off his bishop for the, uh, for the knight. Interesting move, b takes c6, capturing towards the center. And now, is it possible for white to take advantage of that weakening move g5? Not that easy at all, because if you try something like d4, basically giving up that pawn on, uh, on d4 with the idea to open up the diagonal for the bishop, Black can start with g4, and after the knight goes away, and you do take the pawn on d4, white is able to take the pawn on g4. And we have a very unusual position. Bishop is under threat, but black can, for instance, play something like uh, king f8. And how to evaluate such a position? This is almost never seen before. And anyway, this didn't happen in the game, but opening the position will probably favor the side with the... Um, nice pawns in the center with the bishop pair so magnus wanted to make it a sort of a closed game rather than opening it up played here to move d3 hitting the pawn on uh, g5 anyway and black goes for g4 the knight goes back to d2 not an ideal square for the knight but we are attacking the pawn on g4 and after h5 protecting the pawn the knight comes over to b3 hitting the pawn on c5 so black plays here the move uh, d6 and interesting moment because what could be a nice plan for white it's not very clear at all but magnus thinks let's push the f-pawn with the idea that after g takes f3 taking on there's queen takes f3 with a mating threat on the f-file so opening the f-file 
can only favor white, obviously. But after f4, there is no need for black to, to take en passant. And knight e7 was played. Looks like the, the way to develop your knight to keep the diagonal open for the bishop. And now the f-file remains closed. So it's, it's difficult to say if white really wanted to open up that file, maybe f3 would have been a, a better idea so that uh, you do get this uh, chance to, uh, to take with the queen. If black is not going to take himself on, uh, on f3, then we are going to take on g4 with the pawn. So it's, um, it's an interesting line. A lot of different approaches available for, uh, for both sides. But now again, we are on move 10 and it feels like we have already seen so many interesting, uh, bizarre ideas in this opening. And look at Magnus's next move, because this is the sort of move you would probably not have, not have predicted at all. Magnus plays here the move bishop d2, leaving the pawn on b2 on pre, which is taken. I mean, if you don't take the pawn, white probably is ready to go bishop c3, trade off the bishops against each other. and. The more pieces are getting exchanged, hopefully later on black, um, black will suffer from that um, king being stuck in the center. Castling kingside doesn't look like an attractive option with these pawns already being really far advanced. So after bishop takes b2, Magnus is not only sacrificing a pawn after bishop a5, he does threaten the queen. Queen has to go to d7, only move. And now knight 1 to d2 and is... Firusha going to grab the rook in the corner. He can just take the exchange. But after queen takes a1, the queen joins the game, hits the rook in the corner. And uh, apart from taking that rook, maybe the queen can even come in to f6 or g7. So rook g8 could be a very sensible move. But look what's going to happen now. White, I'm pretty sure Magnus had intended here to play the move e5 to tickle this pawn on d6. And if the pawn comes forward to keep it close, then the pawn on c5 is hanging. There's knight takes c5 and the queen is just trapped because the, the bishop, knight and pawn are taking away all the squares from the black queen. Obviously, this is not forced, but if you play something else like d takes e5, then obviously the queen does have more squares available on, um, on the d file. There is this move knight e4 and all white pieces are coming alive. Knight f6 is a threat with a huge fork on the king, queen and rook. Knight takes c5 could be an idea. This position will be very difficult to manage for uh, for black and you you even don't feel like you're an exchange down because there are no open files. Black's rooks are not uh, looking active at all. So black should not take the rook in the corner, not at all. Instead, bishop g7 was, uh, was played. And now, why doesn't move the rook? Just plays queen e1. Because once again, if you take on a1, it's queen takes uh, a1 with the exact same position. And the queen is better placed on, um, on e1. And after black went for bishop a6, gaining the bishop into play, white played rook d1. And now these rooks, these major pieces uh, together, rooks and the queen together, they're looking great. They're ready to try to open files in the center. But... Black plays here the move f5. Very interesting idea with the point that if you do open up that file, black is going to recapture with the pawn. And now the king side is blocked. Black is about to place its king on f7. No need to castle at all. And then put a rook on e8. And black is in great shape because white doesn't have great squares for the knight, for the white knights to, to enter. So rather than taking the pawn, White advances, very important uh, resource, trying to force the d-pawn to move. If you push the pawn, it's going to be knight takes c5, of course. So that cannot be recommended for black. If you do take on e5 instead, rather than taking on c5 now, there is the move queen d4 with check. Doesn't win a piece, white can still play queen f2, but things are not clear at all. So rather than taking on c5, first white should play now move bishop c3, which is an excellent move, pinning the pawn on e5, which cannot move as the bishop on g7 is hanging in that case. And the bishop also covers the d4 square. So now knight takes c5 is a big threat as black no longer has that queen check on uh, d4. White will be in great shape, will regain the pawn and its minor pieces. They will find very 
juicy squares to start targeting the black uh, forces. Therefore, rather than capturing or advancing the pawn, knight g6 was played, putting more pressure against the pawn on e5, but knight c4 played, putting pressure against the knight, against the pawn on uh, d6, so black got to do something about it, and decided here to take on c4. D takes c4, and now you see why the rook went to the d-file, as it uh, opposes the queen there. Black has to do something about the pawn on d6, you don't want to lose that pawn that easily. Played here the move d5. And only at this point, white does regain the pawn. Remember, white sacrificed the pawn on b2. Now it's knight takes c5. But black doesn't really care about giving back that pawn. It was just a double pawn. Queen c8. And the game goes on. It's, it's All of a sudden, it's a sort of blocked position. But black is not doing too badly here at all. With ideas, for instance, to get the bishop back into play. The bishop on g7 is not doing that much. Could better try to uh, attack the knight on c5. And after knight b3, the knight wasn't that stable there, black may have considered playing here the move bishop uh, f8. I think that's a good move, as the bishop is definitely more actively placed on, uh, on e7. If it can uh, control both the diagonals, you can decide what to do with your king, either to put it on f7 or castling. While in case of bishop b4, you are ready to play c5. And uh, following it up with, uh, with d4, it's a, it's a sharp game. It's closed, but both sides are trying to um, expose their, um, their opponent's uh, pieces. Let's have a look what happened in the game. As Firusha didn't play bishop f8, only on move 20, he decided now to castle kingside. But that's not a good move, as the bishop comes into b4 anyway. Not only hitting the rook, the rook goes away, but now the bishop installs itself on d6. And that is just an absolutely fantastic square, as it does prevent the black pieces from occupying the b-file. And it's standing in black's position, depriving the opponent's pieces from a lot of squares. Black may take the pawn on c4, but after knight c5, look at white's pieces. They are fantastic, while the pawn on c4 can just be recollected very soon. Queen a6 played. And now a remarkable decision by Magnus, as he didn't play the move c5. I think c5 was by far the most logical move, and there must have been something he refrained from playing so. Maybe he didn't like that pawn on a2 hanging. But after queen c3, threatening to trap the queen, queen can come back, black is a pawn up. But after rook a1, white has such an easy position to play. He can try to double the rooks, go after the pawn weaknesses on a7, c6, the knight will come into d4 at some point. I don't understand what Magnus saw here. Instead of playing c5, he played the move queen c3. But now the key idea is that, of course, queen takes a2 would be a horrible move because of rook a1 and the queen is trapped. So black is not going to do that, but you don't want to allow c5. And instead, black could have sacrificed the pawn here by playing c5 himself. And this is an absolutely key idea to create more space for your pieces and the main point being knight takes c5 is met by queen takes d6 that is a move which may have been overlooked by both players now you understand that in case white is going to take the queen the queen on c3 will be taken as well and black ends up with an extra piece so that should be avoided but for instance after bishop takes c5 instead of knight takes there's d takes c4 it's an open game I don't think black is any worse here. It's just a, a fighting position. But instead, there followed the move rook a d8. Of course, Fiorusha is looking at the plan of getting rid of that bishop on uh, d6, making use of this uh, pawn on e5 being pinned. But of course, now Magnus has this uh, clever plan of playing the move uh, c5. Now you can always recapture with the c pawn. And look at this bishop. It's paralyzing not only the rooks but look at these two minor pieces of black they can barely move bishop h6 attacking the pawn on f4 white goes g3 rook d7 now the knight comes into d4 beautiful square keeping an eye on both the c6 and e6 pawn rook f7 let's see fuchsia had an idea in mind with his move but it's not clear at all you will see very soon rook b1 white is going to take over the b file with its rook. h4 looking for counterplay and white 
offers the exchange of queens. That would be very good news, of course. And uh, black is not going to cooperate. Once again, taking the pawn on a2 cannot be recommended because of rook a1. If the queen goes to b2, rook fb1, the queen is trapped. If the queen goes to c4, you can just take on c4. And in the end, pawn on c6 is hanging with an overwhelming advantage past pawn, which will be fantastically supported by all white's pieces. Firusha played the move queen a4, keeping uh, an eye on this knight. And Magnus played the move a3, with the idea to go rook b4, attack the queen, double the rooks, very logical move. But after the move uh, a5, we uh, see that rook b4 is no longer possible. And how should white continue here? The, the very logical move, rook fd1, was played with the plan of overprotecting the knight on d4. And white would love to exchange queens. If that happens, it's just game over. Just now, as long as queens are on the board, there is some hope that the white king will be vulnerable later on. But if white can play queen b3, recapture with the rook, make sure that these pawns on c6 and e6, they are likely to be taken at some point. There's nothing black can do. And of course, Firusha understood that he is in a very desperate situation here. He's positionally busted his position. But look what he did here. He played the move h takes g3 h takes g3 and now bishop takes f4 an absolutely insane sacrifice black gives up the bishop for two pawns knight takes f4 hitting the queen and this changes the character of play white had a totally controlled position and he in my opinion should have never allowed this sacrifice even though it's objectively all fine for white still there was absolutely no need giving black a chance to fight back into the game. Queen b3 played anyway, so the queens were about to, uh, to get exchanged. Maybe queen e3, keeping the queens on the board, could have been an interesting idea as well, as now black has opened up the position around the kings. It could be that white at some point may find some counter-attacking ideas against the black king. But understandably, Magnus wants to try to retain control, plays queen b3. Queens are going to get off the board. Black plays a4, attacks the rook. Rook goes to b4. And now, rook to h7. You may think, this is completely lost. What is black going to do? Everything is hanging. That's probably what Magnus thought as well. He, he may just have taken the pawn on c6, as simple as that. But instead, play the move, rook to f1, attacking the knight. Knight h3, king g2, and now knight to g5. And only now Magnus decided to take the pawn on c6. But here, the knight comes into e4. So the knight is actively placed. And who knows, with a bit of imagination, you can see potential perpetuals. Maybe with rook h3, rook g3, and the king cannot really go away. So this is a potential problem. And if white is precise, he may still here play the move knight e7. But this feels absolutely counterintuitive, as it does allow rook takes e7. Bishop takes e7, rook takes e7, and you look at these pawns, they are vulnerable. If black does get a chance to trade them off, could be that black is even better, but the pawn is really strong, and there are ideas to go rook b7 next, maybe even starting with rook b8, forcing the exchange of rooks when the c pawn is going to decide the game. Instead, Magnus, maybe too lazy to calculate, not sure what he exactly felt at this point, but decided to take a radical measure here by getting rid of that knight on e4, sacrificing the exchange. So we do get a position with two minor pieces and a passed pawn versus a rook. And black has a number of passed pawns here. It's getting totally insane. Maybe Magnus thought he is just winning. He is going to bring up the c pawn and it's game over. But never rule out Firusha at these kind of tricky positions. He will find resources. And he did in this game as well. Rook h3, excellent move. So the rook is about to get behind. c6, king f7, another excellent move. c7, the pawn is almost there, but the rook still covers the promotion square and finds the opportunity to look for counterplay, doubling on the h-file so that there, all of a sudden, there are a lot of checks available. Knight c6, white is planning to go knight d8 check to interfere along the 8 rank, preparing c8 queen. Rook h2 check. King g3, and now rook takes c2. Big moment 
Knight is on the fret. What are you going to do? Magnus played here the move Knight d8, but maybe he should have gone for rook h1 with the idea to control the h file. If you do take, it's c8 queen, and there is nothing you can do here as black. As if you give some checks, the king will be able to hide behind the black uh, pawns. If you do give a check, it could lead to a repetition of moves if you go back to g2, but if you move to f4, it's rook f3, king g5, rook g8, king h6, and now rook h8. This is a fantastic perpetual. There's nothing either side can do. This is ending in a draw. But Magnus played here the move, knight d8 check. King got a move, went to g6, and now Magnus took the pawn on e6. Rook h3, look at these rooks. The king is in trouble, but still, it can go to f4. Rook f3, check. Rook takes f3. Big question is, how are you going to recapture? Firusha made the right recapture. He played e takes f3 with the idea that white is unable to promote the pawn yet as the rook covers the promotion square and black is only two moves away from pushing the pawn to f2 and f1. King g3 was played and now big moment because Firusha could have played here the move f2. Absolutely insane. How are you going to stop the pawn? The idea to deflect the rook from, from c2, from uh, the protection of the pawn on f2, with the idea that if you take, the, the king can just take on f2. But here, look at this idea. f1, knight, minor promotion, check. If the king goes to f4, it's rook f2 with checkmate, as the knight controls both the e3 and g3 square. This is checkmate. If you go to h4, it's rook h2 with checkmate. Absolutely unbelievable. Therefore, only move would be king g2. But then there is the move g3. With the fantastic idea that if you try to neutralize the pawns with something like bishop c5 and preparing to promote your own pawn, then black has the move rook to c1. Preparing something like f1 queen with, uh, with mate to, uh, to come. Rook covers the promotion square and there's no time for white to promote its own pawn. The alternative is to give knight f4 check. And here apparently the best move is king h7. Really bizarre move not to allow any sort of check by white. If you go knight d3, then looks like the knight is controlling the c1 square and white is about to push its own e pawn. But here the other pawn comes into play. f4 is a big move. The knight cannot take it as it does allow rook c1 and f1 queen will come next. If you play e6, now the pawn comes to f3 and now we understand that in this position if the king goes if it takes on g3 is f1 queen it's game over if you go to f1 with your king now it is g2 with checkmate beautiful mating attack with the pawns and the rook this could have happened it didn't happen in the game but it's absolutely amazing sequence of moves. And only now we understand why it's so important to have recaptured in this exact position, not with the G pawn, but with the E pawn. Because if we do have this exact position again, if the pawn from G3 is on E3, E2 would not be checkmate, as then the king can take the pawn on F2, as the rook no longer controls the pawn on F2. So really difficult to calculate. Firusha was in time trouble, didn't find it. Probably he was even relieved that he had survived a very suspicious middle game after rook g2 check, king h4, rook h2. Here the players just agreed to a draw. This is probably one of the best fighting games I have seen in recent times. A fresh opening idea, just basically on move 5. We were completely on a new territory, has never been played before. Two of the strong, strongest players in the world battling it out from a fresh position. Magnus was outplaying Firusha from a very interesting opening with a beautiful pawn sacrifice, exchange sacrifice. But Firusha bounced back in this middle game with a beautiful bi uh, bishop sacrifice on, uh, on f4, which Magnus should not have allowed. But thanks to all these ideas, we got to see this fantastic climax of this uh, game. Well, I hope you really enjoyed this battle. Thanks for watching. Make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you would like to see more fantastic games like this one. Thanks for watching. See you soon.
Bye-bye.